Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight, it was like a bad but still semi-amusing comedy film come to life. Federal authorities, taking a quick break from chasing after Russian Facebook trolls, have exposed a very large nationwide effort by actors, lawyers, private equity moguls to game the college admissions process to cheat. And it worked. Suddenly, unimpressive students became geniuses, totally uncoordinated <laughs> video game players became crew captains or legendary pole vaulters. Some people even fabricated new racial identities to get into school. Amazing. Trace Gallagher has the details for us tonight. Trace? Tucker, late today, a federal judge here in Los Angeles agreed to release actress Lori Loughlin on a $1 million bond. She and her fashion designer husband, Massimo Giannulli, are charged with paying $500,000 to have their two daughters recruited for the University of Southern California crew team, despite neither girl knowing how to row. And now USC says all applicants connected to this cheating scheme will be denied, and those already in school will be reviewed, meaning Lachlan's 19-year-old daughter, Olivia Jade, a YouTube star, could be kicked out of SC. Meantime, the hammer is also coming down on coaches and athletic departments. The charity foundation of Rick Singer, the ringleader of the whole scam, who already pleaded guilty, shows payments of $338,000 to the NYU athletic department and $546,000 to the University of Texas athletic department. There's also a $100,000 contribution to a mysterious Princeville Enterprise, which coincidentally shares the same address as UCLA's former soccer coach. So far, coaches and other athletic personnel have now been fired or suspended at USC, Stanford, Wake Forest, University of Texas, Georgetown, Yale, and UCLA. In other words, this scheme was a pay to not play. Finally, the people who cheated to inflate SAT and ACT test scores are also being rounded up. Tucker. Trace Gallagher, amazing, yet not surprising. Well, two years ago, actress Lori Laughlin appeared on NBC on the Today Show and delivered one of those entirely staged yet seemingly intimate moments that publicists refer to as humanizing. Laughlin's daughter was going off to college, and Laughlin wanted us to know that she might be a famous actress with a team of image consultants and personal stylists on call, but on some level, she's just like the rest of us. So many parents watching, I'm sure, are going through this, where they're about to watch a child go off to college. Kath, it happened yep. to you. Yeah, um, how, hard. Are you preparing for it in any way? I or? think I'm in complete denial. Yeah. I really am, because when I think about it too much, it, it will make me cry. Really? So, I, yeah, I got to stop. Make me cry, just like the rest of us. But in fact, Lori Laughlin is not like the rest of us. Her kids got into college because she and her husband bribed their way in, taking the spots of kids who worked hard and foolishly believed, it turns out, that the system was not rigged. And how about those kids, Lori Laughlin's kids? Were they grateful for the advantage they received? Here's one of her daughters explaining how she feels about going to the University of Southern California. Um, and then the whole college thing, yep, I'm going. I'm living in a dorm with a roommate. Do you want the experience of like game days, partying? I don't really care about school, as you guys all know. The whole college thing. I don't really care about school. Of course she doesn't. Her parents don't care about school either. None of the parents who supported this elaborate fraud care about school. They care only about the credentials that school confers. The school part of school means less every year. The liberal arts curriculum in America has become a grotesque joke. Even the people who make a living from it know that very well. Humanities professors may be the single most cynical people in this country. The sociology of Miley Cyrus, critical texts in white privilege, women's studies. They're mocking us. They've got to be. This is pop art, not education. Nobody's pretending otherwise anymore. Yet even as academia descends deeper into absurdity and irrelevance, college degrees have become more valuable than ever. In modern America, only a small percentage of the population succeeds in the end. And the pathway to that success, to the world you read about on the internet, runs through a relatively small number of elite universities. A ruling class claims legitimacy based on the fact that they have degrees from those places. It's all completely fair, they tell us. They're in charge because they won the great meritocratic competition and got into Yale. You're not in charge because you didn't. But of course, they're lying to you. They were never playing by the same rules. Ironically, it was in fact Felicity Huffman who best explained how it actually worked back when she acted in Desperate Housewives. Watch this.
Art mimics life. Your kids take high-stakes standardized tests that measure their ability for good or bad. People like Felicity Huffman certify their children with bogus disabilities to get extra time on the test, or they just pay someone else to take the test. Your kids have to practice the sport for years to get the attention of college coaches. Their kids just pay some fixer to transform them into soccer superstars and pole vaulting prodigies. Your kids must submit to quotas and affirmative action. They're punished on the basis of their sex or skin color. And we're told this has to be done. We must do this to offset their privilege, the blood guilt they bear for the bad behavior of others generations before they were even born. That's what they tell us, please. If you fall for that lie, it means you really don't have any privilege because people with actual privilege have the knowledge, the money, the connections to make certain that the quota system doesn't hurt them, it benefits them. Elizabeth Warren did it. She lied about her race. That's how she got tenure at Harvard. Now Warren says she has no sympathy for the people who got caught playing the same game she did. So as a parent, how much sympathy would you have uh, for these parents who are embroiled in this alleged cheating scandal? Zero. Zero. Well, the indictments that just came out don't even touch the greatest scandal of all, and that's how the mediocre children of the politically powerful on both sides take top spots at top schools without even resorting to bribery. They get it for free. They're just awarded them for the achievement of being born. That's how Chelsea Clinton wound up at Stanford and Oxford, and then a hedge fund in McKinsey, and then on various boards of big companies, and then making documentary films nobody ever watched, all without having a single original thought ever in her life. You know what that is? That's an aristocracy disguised as a meritocracy. It's a scam. Too few have been punished for it. In this case, only parents, athletic coaches, and a few university advisors have been indicted. No actual admissions officials have been named. As far as we know, none have even been punished. And that's a joke. They knew what was going on. They had to know. What the rest of us don't know but should know is how the college admissions process actually works. What are the rules of it? What are the criteria? Who gets in and why? Those are the key questions in the whole chain from birth to world domination. And yet no one will reveal what the recipe is. Like all systems built on secrecy and deceit, it's opaque. It should not be opaque. We pay for all of this, all of higher education, directly through tuition, and then indirectly, billions in tax dollars, direct or in federally backed student loans. We have a right to know. So open the doors, bring in the sunlight, let's see their books. College is too important to be this corrupt. Bradley Campbell is a sociologist, co-author of the book, The Rise of Victimhood Culture, and he joins us now. Bradley, thanks very much for coming on. So who is the victim in all this, in this scam? Um, the victims are, uh, are certainly the students who are not getting places in, in these schools because people are cheating. That's one of uh, the victims. And I think, um, I mean, I, I, I look at it two ways. One is as a professor and, uh, and somebody who teaches students and, um, and then also as a sociologist who studies these kinds of hoaxes and things. But uh, my first reaction is just as a professor, I, um, and also as someone who did not go to an elite college myself, I don't teach at an elite college now, I teach at Cal State Los Angeles. Um, and if you look at elite colleges, Ivy League universities, we find um, the children of, elite, of elites of wealthy people already very overrepresented. Um, there are 38 colleges, including five of the Ivy Leagues, where um, there are more students from the, um, from families of the top 1% of income than the bottom 60%. So that's the kind of disparities you're talking about. And you have my, stu my the students I teach at Cal State Los Angeles aren't from anywhere close to the top 1% of income, and they work hard. Many of them are trying to raise families while they're pursuing their education, working jobs, and all these things. And so it's on a personal level to see that, and, and you know, it's just outrageous to think of people who are, um, are gaming the system and getting ahead of people who are trying to work. College is still um, um, a pathway to, um, to success for many people, and it's a very hard one for many people um, who have all, all kinds of other responsibilities and things going on. So, and so, this is, so uh, I don't, I mean, yeah, we, could, we could fix this instantly. People yeah. trust the outcome of sporting events because they watch them on TV. It's transparent. You know what happens. You know who won. Increasingly, people know that the whole gateway to the ruling class is controlled by the ruling class, and it 
prevents lots of people from entering on unfair uh, criteria. So why not just tell us exactly how people are getting in, what the standards are for getting in? Why not open the books of the admissions departments at those 38 schools you just mentioned? Yeah, there's there's not much transparency always in how in, in the admissions process, and it's very even for people who may be highly qualified and have good applications, it can still be kind of a crapshoot. That's why you have such competition, uh, you know, between, with the people and, and uh, the efforts to cheat. I think of it in this way: there are always people who are out there trying to cheat, trying to game the system, um, who will do things like this. But what does it reveal when it happens about uh, you know the system? How are people getting ahead? And I think like there's a there's a tiny bit of good news in that you know some of it is paying people to take tests and things so test scores and those kinds of things do matter somewhat if we're thinking about you know is there a meritocracy there's not completely but it's not that merit has nothing to do with how pe uh, of people getting in but at the same time you see these other things you see um, uh, sports being uh, so important wh where people are paying to get on rosters uh, of soccer right. teams and these things you see all these other factors that are important and even when people aren't cheating it's the rich that uh, and, and wealthy people who have advantages there they can pay for their children's extracurricular activities they have the time to do it they can pay for their uh, personal statements and all these other things that matter in college admissions well of course and in this case you had kids who you know had only played Fortnite were pretending to be you know, star bobsledders yeah. or something, and it was literally uh, dishonest. Professor, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Robert Woodson is the president and founder of the Woodson Institute, a frequent guest on the show and a very wise man, and we're proud uh, to have him tonight. Mr. Woodson, thanks very much for coming on. You're here, watching Tuckson. this story <clears throat> unfold. You've been in and around higher education all of your life. What's the takeaway for you? What does this tell you about where we are? I really think it amounts to child neglect and child abuse. Uh, we are raising children in an entitlement uh, mentality, an environment where they feel entitled, and so did parents. One of the most important books that I've read about this, and I commend to your viewers, is Richard Watts' book, Fables of Fortune, What Rich People Have That You Don't Want. And the sequel to that is Entitled Mania, where he talks about the entitlement mentality. The very fact that we are exempting these children from the opportunity to be agents of their own uplift, and, and as a consequence, people like, places like Palo Alto have a suicide rate that is six times the national average among teenagers. There are people in that community who are wearing uh, uh, safety vests at railroad crossings because of a high number of teenagers that feel distress. Uh, of, of meeting expectations. So I think it's, it's worse than that, that this old entitlement mentality uh, that also exists uh, among low-income blacks where the highest death rate is from homicide because reparations is the moral equivalent of what these parents are doing uh, among blacks. When we are creating a so false, you know, moral uh, reparations is the moral equivalent of what we're doing. But rep reparations is, as you know, a, a resurgent idea on the left. It's suddenly popular, at least at least one presidential candidate, but two, I think, Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren, are now calling for reparations. Is that good or bad? It's the most ridiculous proposal that I ever had, I heard. First of all, it's important to deconstruct it a little bit. Reparations, you know, the, the question is, um, who pays and who, who gets paid. People don't realize that uh, it's, uh, slavery, there were blacks who owned slaves as well. There were 3,700 blacks that owned 12,000 slaves. Now, uh, three tribes, the Chickasaws uh, tribes, the Creek Indians, they owned 3,500 slaves. So the question for me and for the audience should be, well, who pays? Do the sons and daughters of those blacks and, and Native Americans that own slaves, do their uh, ancestors, do, do they pay? And so it's, it, it's a little more complicated than people are making. What about the whites who came here after slavery? What about the hundreds of thousands who died uh, fighting again in the Civil War who never owned slaves? Right. And so I just think that we ought to take this into consideration when we're talking about uh, uh, a slavery. It's, it's also providing exemption from personal responsibility 
with all of the problems that black America has, for someone to say that the answers to those challenges are external. Let's just say we accept uh, uh, the, the premise that reparations should be paid. What problem does it solve? If whites paid blacks money on Monday and we come back two weeks later, what would be the impact on black on black crime? What would be the impact of drug addiction, about the high dropout rate? And so I just think it's, it's, it's lethal for, for us to just talk about a simplistic remedy um, so we can do virtue signaling on the issue of race and appear to be champions. What we have done at the Woodson Center is we believe you should look into your, the, the black America's past and find out how our ancestors achieved against the odds where there was racial inequality and income right. disparity. We built hospitals, we built schools, we had solid families. And so uh, it is important uh, for us to not, uh, to, to look back, but also to look at what are our strengths. And uh, frankly, Tucker, uh, I'm gonna say, I think black America needs to uh, abandon complaining about what happened in the past and begin to address the enemy within. That's the challenge we face today. And we won't do that as long as we're looking to the people we say who are enemies to be our liberators. Right. It's just ridiculous. Robert Woodson, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you. Paul Manafort was hit with yet another prison sentence today. That's how dangerous he is at the age of 70. He may die in prison. We'll tell you why. Paul Manafort was sentenced to an additional three and a half years in prison today. The crimes include failing to register as a foreign agent under the FARA law. That's a law that Washington is in no hurry to enforce for anybody else since half the city lobbies for foreign entities and isn't registered. There are a lot of potential offenses Washington doesn't seem interested in investigating, including newly released transcripts of Lisa Page's congressional testimony confirmed that the FBI began investigating the president as, quote, an insurance policy against him becoming president, and that investigation began with almost no evidence against Donald Trump. Fox correspondent David Spunt has more on both stories tonight. David? Hey, Tucker, Paul Manafort looking at spending nearly seven years in prison if you include time served. He showed up this morning here in Washington where the judge said Manafort is, quote, not public enemy number one, but he is not a victim either, end quote. Manafort was sentenced for witness tampering and lobbying violations. Authorities also argue that Manafort lied after a prior plea deal. Combine his sentence today with the sentence from last week in Virginia, also prosecuted by the special counsel, and you get a seven-and-a-half-year sentence. But he's already served nine months. Now, there have been questions over whether President Trump would give Paul Manafort a pardon. The president said this from the White House today. I feel badly for him. I think it's a very sad situation. If the president were to pardon Paul Manafort, he's still not out of the woods by any means. Today, Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance announced a 16-count indictment against Manafort with charges mirroring the federal ones from Virginia last week. The president would not have the authority to get Manafort out of those state charges if he's found guilty there. Meanwhile, new light is shining on Lisa Page's closed-door testimony last year. New transcripts released this week show, along with Fox's earlier reporting, that Page testified Russia collusion was still unproven when special counsel Robert Mueller was appointed in May 2017. Tucker, today President Trump called the Obama Justice Department, quote, a broken and corrupt machine. Tucker. David Spunt, live from Washington. Thanks a lot. Michael Caputo is a former advisor to the Trump campaign 2016, and he's been through the ringer in the last couple of years. He joins us tonight. Michael, um, you watched the sentencing again, this, this, the secondary, the second round of sentencing for Paul Manafort today, and you saw that one of the charges that he pled to was not registering under the Foreign Agent Registration Act of 1938, uh, something that basically nobody in Washington does. Did you begin to wonder maybe if this was a selective prosecution? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, let's, Tucker, nobody knows more than you that, you know, the left views absolute annihilation as victory, and they'll stop at nothing to achieve it. You know, they'll, uh, they'll try and get you fired, try and silence you, or they'll try, like in my family, you know, try and ruin your family or even throw your dad in jail. 
You know, but in the meantime, Paul Manafort's going to jail for a registration charge, and his partner on the Ukraine project, where he was supposed to be uh, uh, breaking the law, is Tony Podesta. And as far as we can tell, Tony Podesta hasn't been indicted. So even a blind person can see what's going on here. In fact, wait, 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 you know, wait, wait, I think it's yet more I stop proof. You there? Was, w w sure. was Tony Podesta registered under the Foreign Agent Registration Act of 1938? I don't, I don't think he was, was no. he? No, he was not. They, when when no. Manafort was, was called on it, so was Tony. And they both kind of extemporaneously oh. registered for it. And they thought that was fine for Tony, but doesn't, I guess it didn't look too good for Paul Manafort. You know, it's, it's outrageous. And, and, and now that we see, you know, Lisa Page's testimony and everything, this is becoming more clear than, you know, than we've ever imagined it would, be, it would become. But look, you know, the, the Manafort, I'm sorry, the uh, Mueller report is supposed to be coming to a close. And my family's had our lives on pause for two years, along with dozens of other families. You know, 81 other people learned this week or last week that uh, nothing, it wasn't over in the House either. Chairman Nadler appears to be starting it all over again and asked us all for documents. And uh, it, it appears that it's going to be a long, long summer with 81 people being marched in front of the House Judiciary Committee. Are you going back? Oh, I won't go back. I, I gave them a, a quick answer, me and my attorney, to their question for documents. We had no documents that, that they asked for. We, I also had the shortest document request of all 81 people, but they still asked my, uh, my attorney if he would present me for testimony. And if I, they're inviting me, they're inviting all of us. And I can't, listen, at the end of the day, Tucker, we've talked several times about this. this can, I've been doing this for two years. It's a long dance. I've testified three times under oath, each time to the same questions. Each time it cost me half a year's salary. And here we go again, just when my family was waiting to press play on our lives, right? And if, you know, I got nothing left. They take taken my business. They've they punched the living crap out of my family. I got nothing left. So what are they going to take from me but my freedom? And the only way they're going to take my freedom from me is if I testify a fourth time under oath and they get so, you know, they, they tear me apart like Democrats are want to do. I'm not willing to do that. So I'll take the fifth and I'll keep doing it as long as my family's GoFundMe holds out on, on GoFundMe.com. We'll keep doing it. I think some of the other 81 people should do it as well. You know, you're a network stood up right. behind you, and I'm hoping people stand up behind me. So I guess the lesson is you should have worked for Jeb or John Kasich. I don't see the feds going uh, after I, anybody who worked on the Jeb exclamation point campaign or, jo or John Kasich. Right. Just notice, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure it's not connected. Well, I mean, Jeb took money from the Chinese, over a million dollars into his uh, affiliated yeah. PAC, so I don't see... Anybody asking them about that? But here we go again with the Russia collusion delusion. <laughs> and by the way, you saw just yesterday Chairman Schiff, who's missing all the headlines and the camera time. He's saying if Mueller's report doesn't come in and it ha and has the president, you know, live uh, tweeting some question and answer with Mueller, he's going to start the whole thing over again. All he's saying is. If you don't release the Mueller report, we're going to rip everybody like Caputo apart limb from limb. That's what he's doing. It's really, we're going to look back on this in, in horror and shame, I think. Michael Caputo, good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Democrats appear to be united in attacking that bad man, Paul Manafort, and pursuing more investigations. But they are split on a major question, and it's impeaching the president and seemingly everything else. John Summers is a former communications director for Senator Harry Reid, and we're happy to have him on the show tonight. John, thanks a lot for coming on. So you bet, I don't quite understand the, re I understand the political reasoning behind Speaker Pelosi's statement the other day that she doesn't want impeachment. But how can you believe, as she has said repeatedly, that the president is a traitor, but you're not going to impeach him? Don't you have to impeach him? Well, I think you, you obviously have to have the documentation. You have to have the facts behind you before you impeach. So I think she was doing the right thing by putting it out there that, no, we're not going to go toward impeachment unless there's actually data to support that. And that's actually been the Democratic position for a long time. So I know that she's been, you know, that in that story, she said that I'm going to make news now. It's not really news because the fact is that's what they've been saying. That's what we've been saying. And it's also required in order to, to have impeachment. But what the House is doing is exercising their constitutionally mandated wait, 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 oversight wait, 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 responsibilities. Wait, wait, wait. Right, their oversight. Okay, but 
they have actually, and Pelosi has specifically claimed that Trump is guilty of crimes that have clearly warrant impeachment. And the first among them is colluding with a foreign power, betraying your own country. She has said that. Chairman Schiff has said that. High-profile Democrats and positions of leadership have said for two years, conclusively, without the, the data you just referred to, that the president I, is I guilty of these crimes. I don't think that's true, Tucker. So why aren't I, I they just, impeaching him? Oh, it's absolutely yeah, true. I, that, I mean, I, I was there in Helsinki when he walked There's, out of the press conference. Really? They said that he was a traitor. Do you remember that? A traitor. That's a quote. I, I remember um, people on this so very network who are also upset with how the president conducted himself during that summit well, and having whatever. a private meeting with Putin. Uh, so that, that actually does I'm, I'm that sure matter, they were. So that's a whole separate okay, issue. Okay. Then maybe they're for Trump's impeachment, too. I'm sure some of them are. But that's the point I'm making. If you think that Trump is a traitor, and you say that out loud, and many Democrats did, not just a handful, many did, then don't you have to impeach him? How can you allow a traitor to remain in office when you have this impeachment trial? Uh, an impe well, because an impeachment on. is just like a trial, just as you said, and you have to have evidence and you have to have proof. But here's the other thing. I'll tell you, I don't want Donald Trump impeached. I don't want to give him that relief. I want him to lose, and I want him to lose badly in 2020. I want him to feel uh -huh. every bit of that pain, and I don't want there to be any question at all that his loss was legitimate. That's actually, I think, our best way out of it, and I think that's the direction we're headed toward in 2020. So with that in mind, very quickly, two questions, and both are spurred by votes that took place in the House among Democrats in the last week. Should 16-year-olds have the vote, and should non-citizens be allowed to vote in federal elections? Uh, my own personal view is that I I'm comfortable with uh, being 18 or above in order to vote, uh, same as serving in the military. In terms of people who are here illegally, no, I don't think they should have the, the, the right to vote. Boy, that puts you on the fascist fringe of your party, John. Crazy. Welcome. <laughs> Good to see you tonight. Thank you. You too. Well, the CEO of Wells Fargo just went to Capitol Hill. His bank has done bad things, says Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She's blaming him for oil spills and imprisoning children. Is that true? After the break, we'll find out. Tim Sloan is the CEO of Wells Fargo. He appeared before Congress yesterday. He was there to testify about the many customer abuses his company has been caught committing, and there was plenty to be said about that, and good. But he also found himself being interrogated from a different direction by fake revolutionary Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She says his company is somehow to blame for how the Border Patrol operates. Watch. Why was the bank involved in the caging of children and financing the caging of children to begin with? Uh, I, I don't know how to answer the, that question because we weren't. <laughs> in other words, your question is bonkers. She then went on to suggest that the CEO of Wells Fargo should be held responsible for the, any oil spills that occur since his bank might make loans to the companies that build oil pipelines. In fact, her fervor got so out of control that she then suggested that Wells Fargo should pay for damage caused by the Keystone XL pipeline, which Wells Fargo did not finance, and by the way, which does not exist yet. Since Wells Fargo financed the building of this pipeline in an, un in an, in an environmentally unstable way, uh, why shouldn't the bank be held responsible for financing the cleanup of the, of the disasters from these projects? Uh, which pipeline are you referring to? Um, either. You know. So we, we were not involved in the financing of the, X, of the XL pipeline. We were one of the 17 or 19 banks that was involved in the financing of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Melissa Francis pays attention to politics and financial markets. She co-hosts Outnumbered and After the Bell. And she's a friend of ours. She joins us tonight. Melissa, what do you, what do you make of that? Uh, first of all, proud to be on with you, my friend, tonight. But I, I watched well, this, you. and this is, so this is the newest game of gotcha. You drag someone up for a beating, and then you beat them about things that may or may not be related to their business at all. So we decided to do an exhaustive fact check of both what she said and also our interpretation of what she, we thought she was trying to say. I mean, she's talking about the caging of children, and as we look through it, I mean, he looked befuddled and, and rightly so there was one company that wells fargo was involved with that they provided financing to this company which built one detention center under president obama 
and they sent us so many photos of it. It has no cages, and it's much nicer than any school my child has ever attended or summer camp. I mean, from what we saw, it's <laughs> lovely. But there's definitely no children that are separated in any way from their families at this location, which I'm guessing was her point. But they also built the facility under President Obama, and it looked rather nice. So the premise of her question was a gotcha that seemed to have no connection to anything that you said that Wells Fargo has done that, that hasn't been great in the past. This just w wasn't one of them. And on the pipeline question, you know, I mean, she, she's going down this road. She names a pipeline that doesn't exist. So you give her the benefit of the doubt, and he kind of pivots to one that does exist, that they did help finance, along with a bunch of other banks. And the premise is sort of like if you provided finance to a builder, if then the operator down the line does something bad, you are responsible. That's like saying if I kill someone in my house, you should go put in jail the mortgage broker at the bank that gave me the loan. I mean, it's so many degrees of separation. It, it just seems like there was enough to pick on. Why are, why are you pivoting to your issues and sort of beating this well, guy? So maybe, well, you're right, but you're approaching it as a smart person from a rational perspective. But maybe it's a religion and petroleum is sin, and anybody who has the taint of sin must be punished. Maybe that's the way that she's looking at it. I guess. I mean, I think it's just this shortcut, easy gotcha. I mean, a lot of the different CEOs here in New York have been facing it. People coming outside, you've financed cages. And they don't really care about the facts of, well, was that, you know, a company that's in the private business, private prison business, did they really build something like that on the border? It didn't matter. It was just that they had some contract with ICE somewhere. So it's sort of this, it, it's, it's, if, if you're even close to any of these things, you're immediately guilty of the worst degree. It's just bizarre. Well, Seems Sir Francis, very, it is always difficult. great to see you. Thank Mortgage you for doing Mortgage brokers, that. watch out. You could be in big trouble. <laughs> you could be in trouble. Good to see you. You too. Boeing 737s, the new model, have been grounded around the world. Are the planes safe to fly or aren't they safe to fly? That's not clear at this hour. We're going to hope to get a little more on it after the break. Planes that are in the air will be grounded if they're the 737 MAX, will be grounded upon landing at the destination. The president announced today that all Boeing 737 MAX planes, the new model, are grounded nationwide after a deadly 737 crash in Ethiopia. The president's order is the culmination of a panic that swept over the globe the last week. Here's part of it. Breaking tonight, the U.S. standing nearly alone as most of the world from Europe to Australia has now grounded that Boeing jet after two fatal crashes. Thousands of Americans are flying in a plane that has been grounded in most of the world. The U.K., France, Germany among the countries now grounding the new Boeing MAX 8. Tonight, why they're still flying here in the U.S. The panic and the grounding that resulted today is, of course, a golden opportunity for China and the EU, which manufactures Airbus, to crowd out the United States from aircraft manufacturing. That's one of the few industries in the world where this country still enjoys global supremacy. Are they behind it? How could they not be? The question, though, is, is the 737 really an unsafe plane, or is Boeing simply the victim of global, global power politics? Michael Pearson is an aviation lawyer and former air traffic controller and a trusted source on this question, and he joins us tonight. Michael, thanks a lot for coming on. So the obvious question is, if there's something inherently wrong with the aircraft, and it's not simply pilot error that has caused these two crashes, why haven't you seen them in the United States? Well, first of all, three things typically lead to uh, accidents. Human error, pilots, air traffic controllers, yeah. um, structures, power plants, or software. And, and what's happened is over the last few generations, the aircraft systems, the software that run these airplanes, has become incredibly complex. So first of all, is a 737 yes. a safe airplane? Yes, it's been the most used and highest uh, number of miles uh, flown aircraft for, for decades in its various generations. I do believe there's a, a, an issue likely in the software side uh, that will be, uh, be uh, fixed and, and more importantly, taught to the pilots and the air crews. I, I think what, what happened uh, has been unfortunate. I do believe the 737, including the uh, MAX series, the 8s and 9s, are safe aircraft. I do think some changes need to be made to training information for pilots and air crews on how to handle these situations. 
uh, and certainly software adaptations that I think the FAA is working on now. Grounding seems like a, a, a pretty severe penalty, and it's one that's going to cost Boeing, is one of the few industries in America that still yeah. leads the world, billions of dollars. Was there another way to do it? Well, actually, I think President Trump did the, uh, took the appropriate action in grounding. Um, the key is how long the grounding is for. The key is how long the grounding is for. Uh, Boeing has already gotten a uh, negative uh, press uh, for this, uh, the, these series of events. Um, so I'm not sure how much more uh, of an effect it's going to be on the stock price. It's already, already down. But more importantly, I think President Trump did the appropriate thing erring on the side of caution when human life is, a, is at stake. If it's what I believe and people in the industry tell me and contacts and sources inside the FAA tell me, it's what I stated before. It's a software and training issue, an information issue that hopefully, while it's way too early to determine probable cause for any accident, will hopefully prevent this from happening in the future. I think the key, Tucker, is to how long does the grounding occur, how proactive is the FAA and Boeing to getting a fix in place and getting these pilots trained. Um, there's approximately... Southwest, I think, has approximately 38 airplanes. This series of airplanes have been grounded. American has the next largest number in United, approximately 250 to 280 flights a day. While it certainly is not good, right. and it's going to affect the bottom line revenue of each one of these airlines negatively. Don't get me wrong, it's not a good thing. And certainly impact people across the country to fly. Um, a two, three, four, five day grounding period and rescheduling of air crews and uh, uh, the flying public. I think it's a small price to pay to prevent um, uh, another um, horrible incident from occurring. Yes, I mean if that's if the, if that's what the stakes are, for sure. You're just you know always rooting for one of the last dominant American you companies. Bet. But Michael Pearson, you thank bet. you for I, our perspective, I, I, that I perspective. You're very welcome, Tucker. Nice talking. Jetliners, thank you. And not the only danger that could be lurking in daily life. Wireless communications are everywhere. And in the form of cell phones and Bluetooth headphones, they're often right against your own brain. Now, hundreds of scientists have just warned that wireless headphones could increase people's cancer risk by exposing the human body to unsafe levels of radiation. Keep in mind, very little is known about this because there hasn't been a ton of testing, believe it or not. Is it worth being afraid? Dr. Mark Siegel is our Fox News medical correspondent and the first person we ask on questions like this, and he joins us today. So, Doctor, I, was, I guess the first thing to note in a story I read this morning, it's not really known what the effect of, for example, the Bluetooth in-ear headphones from Apple might have on the brain. Not yet, not yet, Tucker, but we're getting there. The National Institute of Health last year looked at rats and mice and found out that rats with prolonged exposure have increased risks of heart cancer, of certain brain cancers with prolonged exposure. But that's what our kids are getting, right? Prolonged exposure. We don't have it yet in humans, but we're talking about rays that are like microwaves. They're radio frequency waves that are like microwaves. And with Bluetooth headsets, you're beaming it across your brain. So your chances of prolonged use causing an increased cancer risk when you're disrupting the cells of your brain, the calcium channels in your brain, I think that that has to be carefully looked at. And I don't think that the scientists, 250 scientists over 40 countries, are way out on this. That's just one issue, that they're changing the cells. That's one issue. Another issue is, of course, ADHD is on the increase, attention deficit disorder among people that use these headsets. And a study out of Brazil shows that you're more likely to have ringing in the ears if you use these headsets. And my kids, I can't even get them to answer me, Tucker. I don't know about yours, but they don't even answer me. And now I find out that there are health risks. So, so but I don't, I'm not, I don't understand how Apple could introduce and market a product like this, which has since become ubiquitous, without knowing whether they give people brain cancer. That seems kind of reckless, no? Gr great point, Tucker. And the answer is we've always known that it's the distance from the head that matters the most how far away and that's what they always said cell phone users said well just keep it away from your head but now it's on your head right so we don't know because nobody's done long-term studies in humans yet and again we're only just starting with the rats but the reason you're seeing this outcry is because of the studies in animals male rats by the way only females were okay i don't know why that is but we certainly have to see more and more research on this and again, there's reasons like depression, anxiety that occurs from prolonged use, cutting off contact, lack of communication with your friends, with your parents, with your, with your peers, with your teachers. I'm not for this, and I, and I don't think it's harmless. There's, there's no evidence that low, 
intensity radiation, radio frequency waves like this actually disrupt cells the way that ultraviolet light does. It's not up at that level, but again, right. prolonged use. 350 million headsets were, were sold last year. 350 million. We got to study this more. I'm a little concerned about it. Yeah, I mean, of course, I don't know the answer. I'm hardly a physician. I'm just amazed that nobody's asking the question. Well, we are. Dr. Siegel, I'm glad that you are. Thank we you. Are. We are. Thanks a lot, Tucker. Thanks. Right. Well, the left is now entirely engaged in destroying the First Amendment and imposing a, basically a totalitarian outrage culture on this country. But they're putting their own well-being at risk when they do that, it turns out. And we have at least one example after the break. It was hard to imagine until the other night. That's when Hayes invited a man called Angelo Carasone onto his show. Carasone runs Media Matters. Almost every day, he issues outrage press releases accusing other people of bigotry. And yet, because everything is irony, Carasone is himself an enthusiastic bigot. We know this for sure because he has written about it extensively. It turns out that for years, Carasone maintained a racist blog. One post entitled, quote, Tranny Paradise, addressed a crime story from Thailand. A Bangladeshi man had been robbed and assaulted by a group of male prostitutes dressed as women. Carasone objected to the idea that this was even a story and ridiculed South Asians as inherently ugly and poor. Quote, is the writer a tranny lover too? Or perhaps he's just trying to justify how these trannies tricked this Bangladeshi in the first place. Look, man, we don't need to know whether or not they were attractive. The effing guy was Bangladeshi. What the hell was he doing with $7,300 worth of stuff? The guy's Bangladeshi, end quote. In another post, Carasone described how a male coach at a Japanese high school had sexually abused female players. People in Japan were horrified by this, understandably. Carasone was not. His advice, quote, lighten up, Japs. Later that month, Carasone, by now in a frenzy of racism, heaped praise on a former Ku Klux Klan leader. In still another post from the same period, Carasone described a Jewish man as being handsome, quote, despite his Jewry. Carasone didn't like the man's political views, but attributed them to, quote, his possession of several bags of Jewish gold, end quote. Jewish gold. According to Angelo Carasone, Jewish gold is a problem. Media Matters probably ought to issue a press release about this. They've done a lot more for a lot less. And yet somehow, and this is the remarkable part, Chris Hayes managed to pretend that none of this ever happened. Hayes never mentioned the Jewish gold. He never said a word about the Japs or the trannies or the Klan or even those dirty Bangladeshis who deserve what they get no matter what the tranny lovers say. None of that. Instead, Hayes gave cover to Carasone's bigotry and anti-Semitism. Amazingly, he even directed his viewers to Carasone's website. Angela Corson, of course, all that uh, can be found at Media Matters website, so you can listen to the full clips, get the full context. Right. Pretty well, amazing. Let's... If a guy with a history of ranting about Jewish gold came on your show, would you ask him about it? Would you challenge him on it? How could you not? You'd feel morally obligated. But Chris Hayes didn't. That tells you a lot. Now, to be clear, we're not calling for either of these people to be imprisoned or executed or even fired from their high-paying jobs. We're not planning to organize an advertiser boycott against them. We won't picket their offices with bullhorns. We won't attack their children. But we do think you should know what they're actually like. And in Chris Hayes' case, it's kind of depressing to find out. Turns out you really never know who people are. Joe Concha writes about media for The Hill, and he joins us tonight. So, Joe, if you went on someone's show to talk about how someone had said naughty things 15 years ago, but you had kept a blog in which you used <laughs> the kind of stereotypes and racial attacks that this guy had and referred to Jewish gold and the Japs, I mean, wouldn't at some point you think this is too hypocritical, I can't do this? I would think that would happen if I knew that the interviewer would challenge me on those things. And apparently... Uh, Angelo Carasone knew that probably in advance that wouldn't happen. And with Chris Hayes' case, it's a classification. Pushing a narrative by engaging in the worst kind of bias, the bias of omission. 
a disservice completely to MSNBC viewers for, for not showing them. By the way, The Hill has reached out uh, to the Media Matters president for comment, as have many other news organizations, uh, and he isn't talking. But then again, Tucker, you have to feel sorry for him. I mean, how would you feel if somebody went back into your past and talked about the things that you said 10 or 15 years ago and then demanded that you get taken <laughs> off the air? I mean, I, I mean you got to feel sorry for the guy. <laughs> I do. It would be tough. It would be really tough. I mean, look, I yeah. just want to be absolutely clear. I don't care what he wrote on his dumb blog. He's a terrible writer, by the way. I should say that he's kind of dumb. But I don't care. I don't care at all. If he hurt an actual person, that would interest me. His dumb opinions interest right. me not at all. So I'm not in any way suggesting that he or anybody else should be punished for what he wrote on some dumb blog 15 years ago. But that's because I'm not a progressive and I'm not hysterical. And, and, but and I just I wonder and I don't why. Care. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, who cares? But how can you use this guy as an expert witness on bigotry with a blog like that? Well, you can't. And, and look, there are even people on the left, Tucker, that are talking about how obscene this is, these fishing expeditions. There's a leftist writer named Freddie DeBoer. He's as left as you are right. He came up with this phenomenal phrase. It's called offense archaeology. And he says, go to any space concerned with social, social justice, you know, and you'll find endless surveillance. Everyone is to be judged. Everyone is under suspicion. He goes on to say that that's what liberalism is now, the search for baddies doing bad things like little offense archaeologists. Great saying digging deeper and deeper and deeper to find out who's good and who's bad. Nobody likes this, Tucker, on the left or the right, going back into people's past and finding things to destroy their careers. And that's one of the reasons why the actions the Hollywood media. taped didn't I mean, resonate with President Trump. Yeah. Well, it's dis and it's disgusting, that whole thing, that way of thinking. But very quick, you've been in this business a long time. I have, too. If there's one group of people who shouldn't be throwing stones about their personal lives, probably the National Press Corps, right? Well, of course. I, no one, I, look, I, we all have done bad things, and we could all go back and find something that's bad. The bottom line is with Media Matters, they have no leg to stand on here because when MSNBC's Joy Reid made homophobic, anti Semitic comments, they said it didn't meet the threshold for them to call for oh, yeah. boycotts of her. And now, obviously, that's, that's what's happening with you. And meanwhile, you made some of your statements while you were at MSNBC. And maybe that was the reason why Whatever. it didn't cause a ripple. When you did make them on national radio, it wasn't like you said it in private. It was caught on tape somewhere. These were set on national radio. It's amazing. To be clear, they fired me. I couldn't have stayed. Joe, great to see you tonight. Thank yeah. you very much. All right, have a good one. We're out of time. Back tomorrow. Show that's the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and groupthink. But it's not over. We have good news for you tonight. By special arrangement, live from New York City. Taking oh over God. the 9 p.m. hour, starting in wow. just seconds. Starting tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean you know, Hannity. Can I have one point? I was listening to the whole discussion you just had. How about yeah. this? How about the American people are smart? We let them decide what they listen to, what they watch. And, exactly. yeah. you know... I, uh, well, you know, it's conservatives that stood up for Bill Maher, like me, back in the ABC politically incorrect days, and you and I Rush. Remember. Uh, all right, great show, Tucker, and uh, hang in there. We're doing. We're Thank all you, behind Sean. you. Thank you.